The reading, the reading this morning, as you can see and have heard, is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 18, and that's on page 1224. To Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you all uh, this morning. Um, before we turn to the scriptures, can I just uh, make one comment? Somebody handed me a, uh, an invitation to uh, your carols by candlelight, and it sparked a memory. Um, over 27 years, I think it was, 26 or 27 years, um, the Grosvenor Choir made the trek to Finglas every Christmas uh, and did a carols by candlelight program for us. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and to, um, to acknowledge how huge that contribution was to, uh, to the life and ministry of, of Jamestown Road. Uh, the, first sun, the first time you did it, the choir was bigger than our church, um, which gives you some, some sort of idea of where they started. Uh, and over the years, it developed to uh, where it was very much a case of standing room only. Um, but what it did for us was that it, it, it helped us to uh, establish a, a, an identity and a, a presence in the community that we would really have struggled to do uh, on our own. And so I wanted to, uh, to acknowledge that and to, to say thank you for that. And thank you to Hilary, I see her sitting there. Um, your contribution uh, was immeasurable to us. Um, this, I think, is the first year we're flying solo. Well, I say we, um, they're flying solo. Um, I'm still getting used to being introduced as the former pastor of Jamestown Road uh, after 35 years, um, and I find myself remembering the words of an old aunt. Now, she seemed absolutely ancient when I was a child. Um, she did die at 94, but I was an adult at that point. Um, but she always used to look at me and say, well, it's much better to be an old has-been than it ever was. So um, <clears throat> I didn't understand quite the significance of those words until... Well, I'm learning them. Shall we pray together? Father, we're grateful for your grace and for your love to us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we can be here together today. We thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, that as we think about it today, that you would help us to understand even a little bit more about your grace to us. That you would help us to uh, feel the warmth of your grace in our hearts and that you would teach us to express your grace to those around us. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a period in my life when <clears throat> I considered um, a Sunday afternoon nap um, one of life's little pleasures. 
Um, in fact, if I'm being honest, um, I got to a point where I almost consider it was my absolute right. You know, I work hard on a Sunday morning. Uh, my eldest brother used to suggest that was the only morning I worked. But, um, but you know, I, and, and so after lunch, I would head into the bedroom to, uh, to have a bit of a nap. One Sunday mo afternoon, I was just settling down when the phone rang, and it was my 17-year-old son. And uh, it was, Dad, can you, uh, could you come and collect me in Fibsborough? And um, I said, well, you have bus fare. He said, spent it. So with something of a bad attitude, I got out of bed, got into the car, drove to Fibsborough. As I approached um, the, the bus stop where we'd arranged to meet, um, <clears throat> I could see a little huddle of people. And my bad attitude got another notch worse. As I got a bit closer, I could see out of this huddle of people a pair of legs and crutches sticking out. And I knew they weren't Graham's legs. And I thought, what is he getting me into now? So I pulled up, and immediately I met by this woman who said, oh, you must be very proud of that young lad of yours. And I have to be honest, pride was not what I was feeling. <laughs> and as the crowd parted, I saw this disheveled, wreck of a man lying on the footpath. Graham had used his bus fare money to buy him food and now wanted me to drive him into Abbey Street to uh, Dublin Central Mission. So we bundled him into the car, sort of a tangle of crutches and legs and all of that. And at that point, I realized that there was a reason Graham had had to buy food for him is because he'd spent all his money on booze. And he didn't smell that good either. And so my attitude got another notch worse. So I'm sitting there, fuming in the car, driving towards Abbey Street, and um, just, through, uh, just through Doyle's Corner, and it was as if Dermot, that was his name, had a, a moment of clarity. And he turned to Graham and he said, why are you doing this for me? And the answer came very simply, very quietly, because you needed help. And immediately, I had those twin emotions, a certain degree of parental pride that my son could look past the disheveled wreck and see someone of value. But I also felt rebuked. It was almost as if, looking back, as if God had slapped me up the back of the head and said, I could send my son from heaven to Calvary because you needed help. And you can't drive from Finglas to Abbey Street. And I reflected again on the grace of God, which responded to me simply because I needed help. Grace is one of those things that we depend on. And Peter bookends his letter with grace. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he finishes with. But he begins in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, with grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. And in a sense, his whole letter is about grace. He understands, as we should understand, that we live in a broken world. And that can have a corrosive effect on our faith. False teachers distort the truth. They misrep misrepresent its teaching. So be on your guard, Peter says, so that you're not carried away by their error. Mockers will point out the apparent delay in Christ's return. It's been 2,000 years and he still hasn't come. He's not coming. But understand, Peter says, that the time in which we live is a time for salvation. Because he waits, people have the chance to believe. Because he waited, you and I had the chance to believe. So don't listen 
to the mockers. But understand too that while the day of salvation may be long, it is not endless. And our own struggles with sinfulness can discourage us. We long for something easier. But Peter reminds us that Jesus is coming and will remake the world. Therefore, he says in verse 14, since you're looking forward to this, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And since all of this is a reality, what kind of people ought we to be? Well, people who are alert to the spiritual dangers, whose goal in life is to honor Jesus by growing in faith and in godliness. People who are separated from evil and devoted to him. To him people who understand that they are pilgrims journeying through a land which is not their own anymore, heading toward home. We should be people who, as he reminds us in, our, in his first letter, are looking forward to an eternal inheritance, one which is kept in heaven for them. People who he says, are shielded by God's almighty power. See, our inheritance is not only kept in heaven for us, we are kept here for it. Those who look to the future, and so Peter's last words, Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forevermore. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forevermore. We depend on His grace. Without it, we have no hope. Grace says to us that God treats us on the basis of what we need, not on the basis of what we deserve. It reminds us how Jesus was beaten down so that we could be lifted up. It reminds us how He was rejected so that God could accept us. It reminds us how he was cast out so that God could bring us near. How he shed tears so that our tears might be dried. It tells us how he died so that you and I could truly live. Grace teaches us that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that I can do which will make him love me more. But equally, there is nothing that I can do or have done that will make him love me less. Grace frees us from that nagging doubt. Have I, have I done enough? Have I blown my chances? And so grace takes away fear. It teaches us to turn away from godlessness and to pursue righteousness. It's what allows us to approach God joyfully because we know that it's not on the basis of my righteous works, but on His. It means I don't have to wear a mask I can be honest with God because he sees my heart to the depths and loves me to the sky. God accepts me as I am. Not to confirm me in my brokenness and my dysfunction. He accepts me as I am so that he can transform me and make me what he always wanted me to be. And so his grace frees me to serve him 
with a joyful and with a grateful heart. But of course, the question is, how do we grow in grace? It seems to me the first thing we need to do is to learn more about how God's grace works in, my, in our lives. How every aspect of my life is touched by His grace. How every aspect of my relationship with other believers is touched by His grace. It means also learning to serve out of a place of gratitude as a response to God, not out of fear and obligation. It means leaving, progressively leaving behind that mentality which keeps score and um, which, which keeps track of how I'm doing in place of serving God as a response to him. One which recognizes and responds to his overwhelming generosity. And you see, the more we grasp what he has done for us, and the more clearly we see his grace to us, and the more deeply we understand his grace, our hearts go to him more and more. Our joy increases. Our love deepens. Our service is enriched. As we grow in grace, we see more about ourselves because we learn more about him. And so we find a new motivation to serve, a new strength to extend grace to others because his pleasure becomes our delight. Let me see if I can explore how this works. If, use your imagination, if tomorrow morning my wife turns to me and says, darling, would you, would you bring me a cup of coffee in bed today? I, I, I really would like, I'm kind of tired, and would you bring me a cup of coffee in bed today? Now, there's really only three ways I can respond to that. The first way is to say, get it yourself, your lazy lump. I wouldn't dream of saying that. I just want you to know that. The second way I can do it would be somewhat akin to the way I responded to Graham's phone call. I could do it begrudgingly. I could do it muttering under my breath. Bring her the coffee, but do it really, you know, with gritted teeth. Or the other way I can do it is do it joyfully and willingly and happily because I love her dearly. See, when you love someone, helping them is not a chore. It's a delight. When you love them, their pleasure is tied up with yours. When we understand what Jesus has done for us, when that grips our heart, his pleasure increasingly becomes our delight. Christ was separated from the Father so that we could come close to him. The worthy one died so the unworthy could live. And when you see that, when that grips your heart, serving him becomes a pleasure and a joy. Sacrifice will be no sacrifice. And his pleasure becomes your delight. See, if you're indifferent to him, then his pleasure will be at the expense of yours. Doing for him will be drudgery and sacrifice. But if you love him, serving becomes a joy and a privilege. I think some of the older hymn writers catch it well. Um, John Newton uh, wrote these lines. Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. And a generation or two later, William Cowper wrote this. 
to see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice transforms a slave into a child and duty into choice. See, doing for the glory of Christ becomes a joyful pursuit. But of course, we understand that it's never ultimately about what we do for God. It always comes back to what he has done for us. And at the same time, we grow in our knowledge of God. See, it's about learning his character, learning his ways. We increasingly treat his promises as genuine promises and his warnings as real warnings. We learn to take his word seriously. And here's the, here's the thing. We can't grow in our knowledge of Christ without becoming more like Christ. Because you see, real knowledge changes your attitudes. It changes your convictions. It, it changes your behavior. If it doesn't change you, you don't know it. So as we contemplate his ways and his character more deeply, we begin to see ours more clearly. And the desire to change takes hold. But I want you to notice Peter's exhortation. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge. And, and of course, in one sense, we can never stand still. All of us at times struggle to remember what Jesus did for us and what Jesus commanded us to do. All of us at times want to add bits that we think would be nice or, or perhaps subtract bits that we find not quite palatable. And no matter how old in the faith we are, we cannot rest on years of Sunday school lessons or see you talks or sermons or even personal quiet times because each day brings fresh challenges Challenges to forget what we've learned. To listen to the scoffers and the purveyors of trendy teaching. Each day brings challenges to become weary in the battle. To become weighed down with the burdens of, life, of our lives. So each day, we need to make it our goal to remind ourselves of his grace and goodness and generosity to us. To hear afresh what he says. To reflect on his unmeasured grace to us and what it means. To remind ourselves that there really is nothing that I can do to make him love me more. And nothing in this whole wide world that I can do to make him love me less. And that is never a state we achieve. We don't arrive at some spiritual pla plateau where everything becomes easier. It's a path we pursue. It's not that we can accumulate a store of grace that we can draw on from in times past or for future needs. His grace is fresh and new every day. It's full. It's abundant. It's amazing. It's unending. It's inexhaustible. It's immeasurable. But we grow in our knowledge of it, in our appreciation for it, in our dependence upon it, in our expressions of it to those we encounter day by day. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Diligently pursue 
godliness, pursue his character so that, so that he is honored by our way of living. So that when our friends and our family and our colleagues at work and our classmates look at us, it leads them to speak well of him. Let's pray together. May the grace of God the Father capture our hearts. May the love of God the Son fill our lives. And may the wisdom of God the Holy Spirit direct our steps. Amen. We're going to sing again a song which reflects us or leads us to reflect on the grace of God. Grace unmeasured.